Um, hi, I'm Nancy. This is Lou. Um, can everybody hear me in the back? And Maybe talk in a little bit. you got to hold okay. this like, right in your face. Uh, I guess. Okay, this is weird. Um, all right, so we're both uh, technical directors at Pixar, as Renee said, um, and we like to share our experiences with um, using game techniques for real-time filmmaking. So outside of Pixar, um, we have many ideas for side projects that we um, want to do, but we don't have a lot of time to explore each one exhaustively. So to vet them cheaply, um, we're interested in making small vignettes to get a sense of the world and the story for each one. Um, with our backgrounds, we're used to everything being rendered offline, which basically means that each frame may take hours and, or days to render. Um, in contrast, as you know, games have to render Remember to get that mic up to your face. Oh, sorry. Right up, right up there, like you're okay. eating an ice cream cone. <laughs> in contrast, as you know, um, games have to be rendered at interactive frame rates. Um, also, the visual quality of games has been approaching that of CG films. Um, we feel that with all these advances, uh, game engines are a very enticing tool for creating uh, animated films. So we anticipated two major benefits from this workflow over traditional offline methods. The first being working in context, and basically what that means is we wanted to be able to see every single frame with um, all of our final shading and lighting um, at, in order to make better creative decisions. And secondly, because our scene is being rendered at interactive rates, we could try different ideas, more adventurous ideas that we normally wouldn't have tried in, a, in the normal CG production because of how long the turnaround time would be. So to explore what this would mean for us, we decided to do a one-shot test in a game engine. And our goal from the start was to basically try to achieve a, an offline rendering look. Um, each commercially available game engine has its own visual flavor out of the box. So we knew that in order to make our film or vignette look unique, um, we would need to write a lot of our own shaders and our own tools. So after some consideration of which game engines were available, we chose Unity for its ease of extensibility, and it also helped that it was free. So here's um, the fruit of our labor, uh, working in our off time for about three months, and this includes all of the asset building, the animation, and any of the pipeline that we had to develop. So I'll just play that again because it's really short. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now I'll hand it off to Lou, who will talk about our process. Okay. Um, so just to quickly take you through some of the highlights of the process, um, the front end of our pipeline was fairly traditional. We did all of our modeling and set dressing in Maya uh, and imported that into Unity. And because we were dealing with one scene and a fixed camera, we could cheat the way things were modeled and dressed, really only working on the stuff that you would see in the final frame. This is, of course, very contrary to what a lot of you are probably doing with your VR projects. Uh, for animation and camera, however, we did something a little bit different. Um, in order to get the performance and the deformation that we wanted, we decided not to import uh, joint-based rigs, but instead to cash out our animation. And to do that, we had to develop a pipeline for Unity to play it back. However, all the plants, dust motes, and grass that you see in the, in the shot were all animated procedurally. So efficiency-wise, uh, for our workflow, these parts of the pipeline don't really change too much. The methods and tools we use are the same that we would use in a CG film pipeline. However, every shader you see in the vignette was custom. Um, for example, they all had the option to individually tweak their uh, shadow colors. Uh, something very non-physically based, but crucial for us in really finding the final look. Uh, we also wrote some very specialized shaders 
The moss, for example, uh, uses ray marching to give depth and dimension and could be groomed as desired. In lighting the scene, we knew we wanted to feel immersed in light dappled through tree canopies. Rather than trying to force cast shadows to give us that effect, we projected a procedural lighting pattern on the log and tied it to the scene with faked but effective volumetrics. In addition, we implemented a screen space global illumination effect. This helped tie all the elements together and give greater spatial context. Uh, tweaking all these things in real time was a huge win and uh, very different for us from what we're used to, to doing. Um, and to really push that cinematic feel, uh, we needed certain things that could only happen in a camera. So depth of field and grain helped a lot, but we also needed some anti-aliasing, bloom, and vignetting. At this point, we activated our 30-day Unity Pro trial, <laughs> <laughs> which we really used up until the very, I think, it expired midnight. on midnight the day that we, yeah, anyway, up to the very last second of, uh, of putting in those last uh, finishing touches. So um, granted, this is, you know, this was just a, a test case for us just to feel out what it, what it would look like to make something uh, and try to push the quality in a game engine uh, for, for more narrative stuff. Um, but this particular vignette was never meant to be interactive. Um, we found, however, that working in an inter interactive environment was extremely liberating for us. Without all the post effects turned on, we could make tweaks at anything in the scene, still running at about 60 or 70 <laughs> FPS. Uh, with all the post effects, however, of course, this started to, to tank, and our images rendered at a rate of about five frames per second. Um, this is on our laptops, of course. So uh, that's that thing, sorry. Uh, game engines allow us to create convincing solutions cheaply and flexibly as opposed to the rigid pipelines we're usually finding on CG films. Um, and strangely enough, we found that the front end of the pipeline, all the asset creation, uh, became more of a bottleneck than, uh, than we're usually accustomed to. Um, so, you know, we, we're going through this as, as quickly as we can. There's a lot more information on all the stuff that we've talked about on our blog. If you guys are interested, um, it's at dabbleduo.blogspot.com. And we'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have. You. Big round of applause. Thank you, guys. So beautiful. I mean, that looks like a Pixar short, but it's done in real time, which is crazy. It's mind blowing. Uh, first question. Sure. Um, for us, usually on our you know more full blown CG productions, stuff tends to slow down towards the end. A lot of stuff, uh, as it gets into lighting and rendering, gets backed up pretty heavily, sure. and and that's where we end up paying the cost. Um, for us, because we could iterate on the look so rapidly, that was never an issue. We were always lighting and shading from the first second we had the asset in the scene. So really, for us, the bottleneck in getting the thing through was approving our modeling, approving all of our shaping and stuff at the onset as quickly as we could so that we could yeah. get onto the, the other things. Yeah, and, yeah, and of course, rigging. rigging, yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Next question? Sure. So how do you, like, do you see this affect how you make, like, your next whatever, uh, Toy Story 5 or whatever is coming up. Uh, do you see how these tools could affect the production of that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure, uh, a little bit. I mean, we're, we're not really here representing Pixar's work. Yeah. So um, the one thing I can say is that, you know, there are a lot of people there that are very much aware of what's going on and are looking for ways throughout the pipeline in every aspect to try to find efficiency gains like this. So um, I think you know there's already a lot of work going into that uh, to try to find ways to, to use real-time techniques to get us to better quality images faster. Next question. You thought of using um, uh, VR in your previs at, at work? Has anybody done it? I have not heard of anybody using VR at work. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that that's what we're focused on doing right now, like at Pixar, yeah. But I, I don't know. <laughs> Two more questions. Um, it sounds like you said the animation and the rigging was done kind of beforehand, and 
then you put that through this pipeline. I'm wondering what sort of innovations do you maybe expect to see or hope to see in that particular aspect? Um, I know people are, for instance, doing like facial tracking and then they map that onto facial expressions of the, um, of the subjects. What do you guys think? Like, what sort of innovations are there for us? They probably rely partly on input devices. Sure. Um, I guess for us, I mean, we're <laughs> coming from the whole Pixar handcrafted every frame animation thing, we didn't really have the uh, foresight, I guess, to look into like motion capture or facial tracking for, for that sort of thing. But um, as much as it's a tool for games today, I think that that's you know, just as useful for, for VR films. Um, I think for me, I personally enjoy animating so much that I probably wouldn't go down that route. But yeah, it's more about control and being able to tweak the finest details, you know, in your work. And post caching is not a new thing, you know. Um, it was just a way for us to get exactly what we wanted into Unity. All right, last question. Let's make it really, really mind-blowingly good. Right here. <laughs> I think you you guys are going to do freaking things, great <laughs> movies. He thinks you're going to do great things and great movies, and I agree. What a good note to go out on. Thank you, Leo. <laughs>